Good morning, Pennside. Good morning, uh, everybody out there in cyberspace um, on a very, very cold Sunday. A uh, couple of announcements from me. Uh, first of all, a uh, reminder, um, finance team meeting um, right after the service uh, in the parlor. Uh, secondly, the per capita for 2022 um, is you know, getting started, and the, just like everything else, um, the numbers are up versus last year. It's it's forty three dollars and thirteen cents per member. So, uh, you know, we would ask you guys to you know to send that in if you can, as you know, and, and mark it on your check as per capita. And finally, a third announcement from me: um, Ann Nagel is in charge of a feeding souls program um, where you can cook some meals and take to people in need. And if you're interested, um, you can email Ann for the details. Any other announcements? Good morning. I would like to do just a quick minute for mission this morning. Being a mission elder in Pennside is a very easy task. We have a very loving and giving congregation. And for that, I'm very grateful. And all the people that we serve, I'm sure, are very grateful too. It was brought to our attention and such session approved us doing some help to Safe Burks, which used to be Women in Crisis. Uh, the need was Jill Bechtel brought it to our attention that the need is for food to feed them. <clears throat> Obviously, our kitchen is not working, and with COVID again, there's just no way we can get together as a church and cook and meet the needs of these, help these people. So, Hamid, who runs the uh, Wymessing Family Restaurant, will, for $7 a person, provide a hot meal and dessert for each of the people. So we decided the first one is taken care of privately. It's, we're going to serve them January the 25th. He does everything. He makes the meal, he packages it, and he delivers it. So all we have to do is give him a check for the meals. So what I'm asking is, if you can, we'd like some help to maybe continue to do this a little bit more. If you can donate money, anything would be appreciated and please earmark it for safe Burks. That way, later on, if in February or March we have some money gathered, we will then again do the same thing. But again, there's a great need in our community for all these things, and Pennside seems to always rise to the occasion and help others, and for that I'm grateful. Any other announcements? Hearing none, let's uh, go with Scott's prelude. Thank you for that, Scott. And I just wanted to, to share with you that the reason Scott played 
precious Lord, take my hand. Uh, that was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite hymn. And as he lay dying, he asked that this song be played at his funeral. And he said, play it loud. Thank you, Scott. God created all the races and nations of the world and willed that we live together in peace and harmony. We are made to be family. There is strife in the human family, injustice abounds as racism, classism, sexism, cultural imperialism, and other isms. We are a divided people. We have been called to let justice roll down like waters. We must work passionately to bridge the gulf between us, overcome the injustices that oppress us, and restore community among us. We must be determined to change what we can. We must have the courage to accept what we cannot change. Above all, we must be wise enough to know the difference. Please join me in the prayer of the day. We turn to you often, O oh God, as we seek through prayer to find the meaning of life. Sometimes it's a fervent prayer in the midst of serious mediation but more often, it's a fleeting prayer on the run. We pray for patience when there are too many things to be done. We pray that you will awaken us, hear the cries of the poor, the homeless, brokenhearted. Help us to redirect more of our resources to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. Mold us, O God, and open our hearts and minds to be willing vessels of your spirit. Amen. Oh, sing to the Lord. Oh, sing God a new song. Oh, sing to the Lord. Oh, sing God a new song. Sing to the Lord. God. 
In the light of Christ, we see the darkness of our world and of our hearts. Trusting in God's saving love, let us confess our sins. Please join me. Most holy and merciful God, we acknowledge and confess our slowness to do good, our blindness to injustice, and our complicity in deferring the dreams and hopes of the oppressed. We refuse to heed your call to justly love mercy and to walk humbly with you, our God. We condemn racial injustice in our pronouncements, yet we cling to the privileges derived from inequity. When we ought to be ashamed of our failures, we prefer to cling to private, selfish, imprisoning desires. We participate in our own oppression. Help us to name our sin, to claim responsibility for our actions. In accordance with the commands of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Shake us from our sleep with your imperative to do justice. Move us to action with the compassion of your grace and give us courage to pay the price, however painful or costly, that the justice you will may be done on earth as in heaven. Hear the good news. Christ unmasks the idols of our world and frees us from slavery to all that would oppress us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As a sign of God's work in our midst, let us share what God is giving. The peace of Christ be with you. Shall not wait for the dawn of their ideas. 
God of grace and God of glory, grant that as we hear your word read, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may hear what you would say to us today. We may believe what you command us today. We may obey. That your will may be done on earth as in heaven. O oh Lord, by the power of your Spirit, help us to hear your word today. Through Christ, amen. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. <clears throat> to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by, by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. The psalm for today is Psalm 36, and it's a short reading. It's uh, verse 5 through 10, so why don't we just read it together? Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. And Silas bound in jail Had no money for go to bed Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on Hold on Hold on Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on Paul and Silas began to shout Doors popped open and they walked out your eyes on the prize hold on hold on hold on keep your eyes on the prize hold on got my hand on the freedom plow won't take nothing for my journey now keep your eyes on the prize hold on hold on
chains we can stand all the chains in hand in hand keep your eyes on the prize hold on hold on hold on keep your eyes on the prize hold on freedom's name is mighty sweet soon we're going to meet Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. I got my hand on the gospel plow, won't take nothing for my journey now. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 2. Here, yet still surprising story of the wedding at Canaan. <clears throat> On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And the disciples believed in him. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray. O oh Lord, for the gift of your word read, we give you thanks. Now as your word is proclaimed, we pray that in so far as what is said is true, you would write it on our hearts and give us the grace to believe. And so far as it is false, may it fall to the ground, soon be forgotten, and do no harm. Amen. Weddings can be complicated. Expectations run high. The dress, the hair, the makeup, the shoes, all must be perfect. The venue whether it be the church or whether it be a destination wedding or whether it be in a restored barn or wherever it might be, it must fit the occasion perfectly. The dinner and the dessert must be delicious. And of course, yes, the wine must flow in abundance. Two families come together at a wedding with all of their dynamics. And these families bring their communities. Weddings can be as private as two individuals and the preacher, but more often than not, the room is full and ready for the big event. What a wedding. The pressure is on. And our seemingly innocent miracle of Jesus turning the water into the wine, making him clearly the best wedding guest ever. This miracle swims in the dark waters of shame that flow from a public failure to meet expectations. They have no wine. Worst wedding reception ever. 
What a wedding. The story begins innocently enough. John tells us on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Immediately, John alerts us that there is something more going on here. On the third day could just be simple chronology. But given that the Apostles' Creed teaches us on the third day he rose again from the dead, and the third day is forever known as the day of resurrection, it seems incredible to me that John tells us this simply to set the calendar straight. Something is up. A sign of God's reign when heaven and earth are one and shame and scarcity are no more. A sign of that glory is about to take place. Resurrection is in the air. What a wedding. Mary is likely at the wedding because this is somehow related to her family. Now there are all sorts of legends that seek to fill in the blank of whose mother's cousin's nephew was the groom. But it seems like she was connected to the family of the groom because she was aware that something terrible had gone wrong. John tells us when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now I do not think this is a mere observation. The baklava is delicious. Tomorrow I'm getting my nails done. They have no wine. No, I think Mary is saying this to Jesus using the mom voice. As when mom says, David, there are dishes in the sink. David, there are folded clothes on your bed. Jesus, they have no wine. Mothers have very good diction with the mom voice. And when moms use the mom's voice, these are not observations. These are commands. The expected response to these statements is, I will wash the dishes right away, mom. I'll put my clothes right away, mom. I'll get some wine, mom. Oh, if only we sons and daughters responded properly to the mom voice. Jesus does not respond correctly. John tells us, and Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Now to our ears, Jesus calling his mother woman seems rude and disrespectful. But as he hangs from the cross in John 19, we read, when, Je when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to his disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So I suspect we are dealing here with a first century way of speaking that was tender at the time, but rings harsh to modern ears. That being said, Jesus gave the wrong answer. They have no wine is meant to inspire action. So I imagine that between verse four and verse five, there's a pause. And Mary shifts from the mom voice, and things escalate, to the mom look. And there's a pause as mother looks at son. And maybe she tapped her foot. Then John tells us, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And when Jesus tells them to fill those jars with water, they are more than happy to run off with their buckets and escape the mom voice and the mom look. And the servants fill those jars right to the brim. And when they draw out the sample, the master of ceremonies sings the praise to the bridegroom. Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you've kept the good wine until now. Can you imagine the relief that the bridegroom and his family felt? Public disgrace was a glass or two away. They would be the laughingstock of Galilee and the word would get around, don't be like so-and-so's family. They ran out of wine. And now all of Galilee will sing their praises as the family 
who save the best for last. This first sign of the glory of God that was in Jesus Christ our Lord inspired his disciples to believe that he was more than a great teacher. This first sign showed how God can transform scarcity into abundance if we only will trust and obey. If those servants only filled the jugs up halfway and took the easy way out, instead of hauling at 30 gallons per jug, 180 gallons in all, which equals almost a thousand pounds of water. And they had to haul that water probably from the base of the hill to the top of the hill. Because Galilee is very hilly and what's Cana, what is called Cana now sits on top of a hill where you can buy wine for your wedding. And so if those servants had taken the easy way out, instead of going from scarcity to abundance, the wedding would have gone from scarcity to adequacy. And yes, it's better to have enough than to not have enough, but ah, uh, when there's more than enough, what a wedding. Well, good for them. Blessings on the bride and the groom. May their union be blessed. But what's that got to do with us today in the hour in which we live? Tomorrow marks the federal holiday in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King rose to prominence and won the Nobel Peace Prize for his leadership of the nonviolent civil rights movement. And that's typically all we think of with Dr. King, but there's more. In the 1960s, his focus changed to opposition to the Vietnam War, <clears throat> calling for a peaceful, nonviolent resolution to that conflict. And his focus shifted to the enduring reality of poverty in the world. In his Nobel Peace Prize address in 1964, Dr. King said, a second evil which plagues the modern world is that of poverty. Like a monstrous octopus, it projects its nagging prehensile tentacles in lands and villages all over the world. Almost two-thirds of the peoples of the world go to bed hungry at night. They are undernourished, ill-housed, and shabbily clad. Many of them have no houses or beds to sleep in. Their only beds are the sidewalks of the cities and the dusty roads of the villages. Most of these poverty-stricken children of God <coughs> have never seen a physician or a dentist. There is nothing new about poverty. What is new, however, is that we have the resources to get rid of it. The rich nations must use their vast resources of wealth to develop the underdeveloped, school the unschooled, and feed the unfed. Ultimately, a great nation is a compassionate nation. No individual or nation can be great if it does not have a concern for the least of these. The coronavirus and its various waves have exposed the reality of poverty in our nation, in our world. Hunger has a new name, food insecurity. Yet what are we as a nation doing about it? Yes, as, na as individuals and as congregations and as communities, community groups, we are giving generously. But poverty will not be overcome by charity because people will still live in the fear of having to say to their children, we have no food. And here's the thing. As demeaning and shameful as it is to live in poverty. And I remember the shame that Janice and I felt at my first church when our income was so low that we qualified for the WIC program and got free formula for our children. We would go to the grocery store at odd hours to avoid church members and anyone that we knew and they would see us using food stamps. As damaging as the experience of poverty is for the poor. I believe that the existence of poverty and our toleration of poverty is a blot on our souls and on the soul of our nation. I believe that the existence of poverty feeds into our fears of scarcity and want, which ultimately prevent us from experiencing the abundance of God. We are the servants who only fill the jugs halfway. What if the water spills? What difference does it make? It's not like the water's gonna turn into wine right? A budget is a mission statement. What are we here for? Why do we exist? 2021, we as a nation spent $705 billion on our defense. 
$705 billion. Meanwhile, census data shows that 13.4% of Americans are living in poverty, over 42 million Americans. We are so concerned about being pro-life and anti-abortion, but what do we do to help mother and child after the child has been born? Do we help with the daycare and the preschool costs like other industrialized nations do? No. Do we provide supplements to help raise them out of poverty, again, like other industrialized nations do? We allowed that tax credit to expire. Do we provide universal health care so that the mother can receive the prenatal care and the health care for her child after the birth like other industrialized nations do? No. And so is it still true that a single unwed mother has chosen the path of poverty to have that child? Yes. Now, is there a price tag to all these proven ways to overcome poverty? It's not free. But what's more important to us? Spending twice as much money as everyone else in the world to feed what President Eisenhower prophetically called the military-industrial complex, or spending as much per capita as the rest of the world does to overcome poverty. All I know is this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Poverty was an unwelcome guest. They have no wine, because they can only afford so much wine. And the glory of God shone forth as servants filled those 30-gallon jugs to the brim, took a sample to the master of ceremonies who smacked his lips and exclaimed, this is the good stuff. You've saved the best for last. Poverty is not a political issue. It's not about conservative versus liberal and our usual arguments to avoid the problem while seeming to care. Poverty is a moral issue. Poverty is a spiritual issue. Poverty is the antithesis of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and on that third day of third days, when the hour comes, and the bride of Christ will be presented spotless and without blemish, and the marriage feast of the Lamb will begin, no more poverty, no more scarcity, no more fear of running out, no more. What a wedding. To believe in Jesus Christ is to offer our lives in service of that day as Dr. King did. To believe, <coughs> excuse me, to believe in Jesus Christ is to proclaim that the way it is is not the way it should be or shall be, as Dr. King did. To believe in Jesus Christ is to serve as the conscience of our nation, calling it to break free from the evil it condones and live into a brighter day when no one is judged by the color of their skin or the amount in their bank accounts, but by the content of their character, as Dr. King did. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And we are the servants, and we have the buckets. How much water are we willing to carry? May God grant us the courage for the facing of this hour. May God bless his people with strength as we carry the water that results in transformational change and leads to the eradication of poverty. May we one day see the poor dance with a kind of joy. We see in the face of bride and groom as they come together on the, wedding, uh, on the dance floor at the reception for that first dance. And on that day, all God's children will rejoice and say, what a wedding. Our confession of faith comes from the confession of 1967. Let us confess our faith. In each time and place, there are particular problems and crises through which God calls the church to act. The church, guided by the Spirit, humbled by its own complicity, and instructed by all attainable knowledge, seeks to discern the will of God and learn how to obey in these concrete situations. The following is particularly urgent at the present time. God has created the peoples of the earth to be one universal family. In his reconciling love, God overcomes the barriers between sisters and brothers and breaks down every form of discrimination based on racial or ethnic difference, real or imaginary. 
The church is called to bring all people to receive and uphold one another as persons in all relationships of life, in employment, housing, education, leisure, marriage, family, church, and the exercise of political rights. Therefore, the church labors for the abolition of all racial discrimination and ministers to those injured by it. Congregations, individuals, or groups of Christians who exclude, dominate, or patronize others, however subtly, resist the Spirit of God and bring contempt on the faith which they profess. As we come to our time of offering, continue to thank you for your generosity, which allows us to continue uh, to minister to families and to our community in need. And so now we offer you a minute of peace. prayer requests uh, this week. It's been a, a challenging week. We want to continue to pay for um, the family of the Reverend Ray Brubaker, for Sue, for um, Sarah, Brad, and Bart. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Barbara Fankoviak. I spoke with her son, John, and she is not doing well uh, in uh, South Carolina. She is on hospice care. Uh, also, I want to continue to pray for Pete, Amanda, and Mike Rach, as we'll be having uh, a Jerry's funeral tomorrow. But want to hold them in our prayers. Also, I uh, want to pray for Guy Haig. Uh, he had a fall this week. He had surgery, I believe, yesterday. He's in Reading Hospital. Uh, also for Paul Lucia, who was facing surgery to deal with uh, something. You know, the previous procedure didn't go well, and things have gotten complicated again. So we want to pray for Paul and for Barbara. I want to pray for Andre Hauser, who did this wonderful sound system and video system that we have, and he is dealing with a serious illness. Also, uh, Steve Katzenmoyer, who is a friend to the music community here in Reading, uh, also facing a serious illness. Uh, I want to pray for uh, Grace Andre and for her family. Uh, Grace's brother, uh, Harold Engelman, passed away recently after a long illness. Um, if you saw the news yesterday, uh, you saw about congregation Beth Israel down in Texas where there was a hostage situation uh, with the rabbi being held um, and that is a reformed Jewish congregation and so we want to pray for them and we also want to pray uh, here in in Reading for Temple Oheb Shalom which is Reading's uh, reformed Jewish synagogue and uh, Rabbi Brian Michelson who's a dear friend I want to hold them all in prayer um, so uh, let's pray <clears throat> Holy God, as we look at all of these things that are happening, serious illnesses, profound surgeries, life and death, 
Lord, we give you thanks that in life and in death we belong to you. You are our comfort and you are our hope. And so we lift up to you our brothers and sisters and their needs. We lift up to you Guy and Paul as they face and recover from serious leg surgeries. We pray, Lord God, that each of their situations with its own particular complexities and difficulties and challenges, Lord, that you would bring healing to them and strengthen them and that they could enjoy good days. Uh, we pray for uh, the family of, of Reverend Brubaker, and we pray, Lord, your uh, grace and your peace to be theirs, Lord, that they would know our love and your love, and Lord, the good news that for Ray, his faith is sight. Lord, may that be a comfort to them. And we pray for our sister Barbara. We pray, O oh Lord, uh, for your mercy and your grace and your peace. Uh, Lord, we pray that she would come to a gentle and peaceful end. O oh Lord, have mercy upon her and upon her family. We pray for Pete, Amanda, and Mike Rach, uh, Lord, as they grieve the sudden death of Jerry. And Lord, we pray that you would console them and comfort them and strengthen them as only you can. We pray for Andre and for Steve as they deal with very serious illnesses. We pray, Lord God, for your healing mercies to be upon both of them. We thank you, Lord for their graciousness, for the gifts they have shared here and in our community. And Lord, we pray that you would restore them and renew them. We pray for Grace Andre and for her family as Harold has uh, passed away and is with you. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort them all uh, with that promise of resurrection. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would console them in their sorrow. Lord, we pray for Congregation Beth Israel for our brothers and sisters at Temple Oheb Shalom, Rabbi Brian, Rabbi Brian Michelson. Oh Lord, we live in a world where there is such hate. And we live in a world where religion is a reason to turn against one another rather than turning to one another. And Lord, we pray that you would console them, you would comfort them, and Lord, you would help us all to be in our own ways, instruments of your peace, renouncing anti-Semitism, renouncing, Lord, these ways that we hate one another rather than loving one another as you command us to love. And Lord, we pray as well for ministries like Safe Burks and other ministries in our community which help serve the least of, the, least of these and help ease the burden of poverty. Lord, we long for the day when those services will not be needed. We long for the day when we as a nation will come together and change our ways that there may be enough for all and not just for some. Oh Lord, may that day come soon. And we pray for that day, praying as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, we are not dismissed. We are sent to serve. We are sent to serve the needy with an open hand. We are sent to serve the stranger with an open mind. We are sent to serve our neighbor with an open heart. We are sent to serve our Lord, whom we will meet when we serve. And as we go forth to serve, know that we do not go alone. Jesus goes with us, above us to watch over us, beneath us to sustain us, beside us to befriend us, behind us to defend us, before us to show us the way, and always within us making all things, including us, new. Go in peace. Go with God. Amen. Amen.